It's been a long time since we first came down to the canals and did our soft baiting the canals type video. And during that time, there's been a huge change in what's going on down here. For a start, we don't seem to have anything like as many salmon around there. But the plus side of it is, there's more and more rainbow trout, more and more brown trout. And gee, are they big. I tell you, I like to get onto those. Some of the methods we used when we were soft baiting when there was just salmon everywhere, worked extremely well then. But you know, we've got more pressure, more people coming down here, so we need to change the way that we do things in order to get the best results. And so we're gonna do a video which is gonna give you what we think are the very best results. Because several of us have been working on a scheme to make sure that we catch more fish. I love to come down here because there's just nowhere like it when it comes to enormous trout, when it comes to great fishing experience. There is nothing like the canals. It is truly world class. And if we put some of the little ingredients together, you can have the same sort of pleasure that I'm getting out of this place. And that's what we're about to do today. We want to teach you, we want to give you some tools that means that when you go out there, you're going to have so much more fun. So what I want to talk to you about is touch fishing or drift fishing and we often use eggs with this but we can use all sorts of things. We can use nymphs, we can use small soft baits, we can even use shrimps. All sorts of bits and pieces can be put on the end but I want to teach you the method. It's critical that you follow this right through. My experience is I've seen a lot of people have a go at it and very few do it well. Those who do it well have magnificent results. And so we want to make sure that we've covered all the little bases and I'm going to try and think of all the things that I've learned over the time so to, get, to give you a real helping hand up so you can get the sort of results that we're getting. And it works like this. You think about a big trout sitting in the canal here. Now life's not too bad, especially on the outside of the cage where well they throw your food on a regular basis and you can just sort of glide along and wait for some food to come past and grab it. And don't forget this whole system is rich with all sorts of uh, other species in there other than the pellets that are involved. So you've got snails and you've got small fish and you've got all sorts of other things, flotsam that they are eating. They are very happy here. Now, the way a trout eats is very simple. It sits in the current and it waits for something to come past on its own conveyor belt called the current. And so what we're trying to do is imitate what happens in a natural situation. The key thing for us is to realize that trout are used to seeing things come directly down the current and a bit like a soccer goalie, they just sort of go into the right area and intercept what's coming and there you go, you've got yourself a feed. Now remember, these are not real hard pursuers so it's unusual for them to decide, oh gee, I better scream off over here and grab something that's out of my zone. Generally, it comes straight down to them and they absorb it and then if nothing happens, they let it go when they realize they've made a mistake. So when we're feeding them something artificial, it's critical for us to make sure that we strike when they do have that bite. Now anybody who's done any fly fishing understands that because fly fishing is very much about dead drift. We drift down a nymph or we drift down some sort of food imitation on the current and along comes the fish, intercepts it, closes its mouth, realizes it's made a mistake and then lets it go. And that moment where it's got its mouth closed is the time that you've got to be able to set the hook. And so all our systems, all that we're doing in our uh, touch fishing here is making sure that we stay in contact and we know that the fish has got the bite and then we set the hook when it is there. And that's, I guess, what it's all about. So we're going to give you some details on how that's going to happen. First off, we're going to talk about the gear you need uh, because much of what we do is done on very, very fine scale. It's my general belief to go as light as you can with the weight that's on the far end of your setup 
uh, in order to get the job done. So the lighter, the better. Now we've been very fortunate to be working with uh, sounders in the uh, canals as well. Now these sounders have given us a tremendous amount of information about where the fish are and where they actually are in the water column. The fascinating thing for me is that I've re realized that these fish move in quite big shoals. At times they might move kilometers away from where they were originally fed and it's for us to catch up to them. Fishing where there are no fish is a waste of time. And I've had people say to me, oh look, you're cheating with a sounder. Well, we cheat with all sorts of things. I don't know about you, but I'm time poor and I want to get fish rich. And the way I do that is by maximizing my chance. Just like if you went into the open sea, you wouldn't go and just drop a, a, a line anywhere. You look for the structure, you look for the fish and away you go. So that's what we're doing. The more I've done of that, the more I've learned about how we need to get the right gear to the right fish at the right time. And so we're gonna give you a little bit of our knowledge of what we've learned from that so you can get better results. But the critical thing is to get gear that's gonna do the job well. Now the essential ingredients center around having a very good quality rod. And I like to put it this way. You know, people talk to me that they wanna go out and do a bit of tar hunting. Well, you wouldn't go out tar hunting with your 30-30 that you just had in the cupboard. You go out and you buy a specialist rifle and then when you've got the rifle, you stick on top of that a decent scope because you might need to shoot two or 300 meters out in order to get your prize. But for some reason, we don't think like that when we come to the canals. But let me tell you, if you have a high quality rod like this lock specimen I've got here, what this will do is cast much further distance with little tiny weights. And that's what it's all about. Not only that, it's incredibly sensitive. So now all of a sudden we are shooting out at 250 meters, we're getting our prize and we're coming home happy. I like to use a long rod. My stock and trade is eight foot, which is quite long when it comes to what you're doing with normal uh, trout fishing situation. And this particular rod is capable of casting all the way down to one and two grams and it will cast at huge distances. That means when it gets out there, it's gonna just quietly flow and I'm gonna have very good contact. The other thing that's really important is the sensitivity. And this is made of the same sort of material as what you get on the very best of fly rods. And of course, they do quite a big job on very light pieces of uh, fur and feather in order to get that trout. So my advice, get yourself a decent rod. That's the most important thing. Coupled with that, you need a decent reel. And of course, it's gotta be one cable of catching fish in the 20 to 30 pound mark. You wanna be able to land them when you hook them. Uh, and the other really important ingredient is braid. Now, I've been a real believer in high quality braid, and that's for a very simple reason. And that is, high quality braid casts further. Remember, what we're trying to do is not catch the fish that's all close to us that we can see, and it's laughing at us, and we're laughing at it, and we can waste a lot of time on that. But you know, there'll be a fish somewhere over the other side of the canal, or out in the middle of the canal, that's sitting there, doesn't know we're there, and all that fish is gonna see is our bait when we get it in front of them. I want to catch that fish, so I want to cover as much water as I possibly can to get to that fish. And that's the heart of getting the presentation for touch fishing. So much of the development of our technique has revolved around using eggs. And I found that trout particularly are extremely fond of eggs. I know people come down here and they use shrimps. Well, I've never seen any naturally occurring shrimps in there, but they're triggered to grab them. Well, they're the same way about eggs. And I have seen eggs in here because it, certainly at this time of year, which is in the autumn, as you may see by the colors behind them, these, these fish are getting ready to spawn. That makes them extremely aggressive. It makes them extremely focused on eggs because it's all about reproduction time for them. So I've got a range of different colors here. And the reason that I use a range of different colors is that I have found that some work better in some situations than others. I've got different sizes. These here up the top here are eight mil eggs. These down here are six mil eggs. And if I was to shine a black light on them, some of them would glow and some of them wouldn't. And certainly different times we get better results. So often I will fish two of these at once just to see if there's a preference for one color over the other. I would encourage you, start out with one and then go and as you master the, the drift and you get it all working right, then go to having multiples. You might even get involved with something else that I like to use, and I've certainly done a lot of this with my fly fishing, and that is just glow bugs. But of course, we can put on all sorts of things at the base of this uh, system. You can put on booby flies, you can put on just standard nymphs like a big heron copper. You can put all sorts of things. You can put a black streamer on there. 
and the fish will take it. The key thing is we want to be able to get these things to the fish in such a way that they'll react, grab it, and we'll set the hook. One of the critical things in our egg drift fishing is to use the right sort of weights. And we're very fortunate we now have something called a drop shot sinker or a slip sinker. And this uh, is available, it's long and thin, it's available in a whole pile of different sizes, all the way from a sixteenth of an ounce at the bottom, right up to oh, over half an ounce. And of course you realise that the canals travel at a different speed depending on how much electricity is being generated. You need to keep your eggs running at the same speed as the canal as much as possible. You don't want them catching up and stuttering and just not looking natural. The more natural they look, the better. So you're trying to get the lightest possible sinker to do the job that needs to be done. So we have a variety of these sinkers. They're easy to put on and to put off. Remember, if it's nice and taut, you can pick up that take so much better than if it's all loosey-goosey. When you can't feel the take, you can't set the hook. And so uh, anybody can get the fish that grabs it and runs the other way. It's the one that comes along sitting in the current, just bites on it and lets it go. You need to be able to detect that fish. Or the other one that comes and he swims towards you. You need to be able to detect that fish. Really good anglers are good at detecting the ones which are harder to pick up. So make sure that you've got your sinker out there as, a, uh, as an anchor and then have that sensitivity to make sure the line is straight so you can set that hook, catch that fish. So I want to show you the typical setup I have in order to get this system working. And that involves having, obviously, braid, which is vitally important for us to detect everything. And then we put on a length of fluorocarbon leader, and I often use just around seven or eight pound. If it's really clear, I'll go to, to seven, and sometimes even down to six. I tell you, it's challenging when you catch yourself a 20, 25 pound fish on six pound line. I tell you, your cheeks are all tight together, you're working hard because you want to get this sucker in. But you know, if you go fine, you have more chance of catching fish. And of course, that's what the fly fishermen are all about with using their lightweights. So I put in a leader of around two meters all the way down to the far end, where of course we're gonna put my weight. And then I add in a dropper. And I do this by getting a piece of fluorocarbon, similar to the breaking strain of that, and I tie a surgeon's knot right at that particular point. Now a surgeon's knot is basically two granny knots. We go over once, pull it through. We go over a second time, pull it through and I make sure it snuggles down nice and neatly. It should look, when it's nice and done, it should look like that. No pressure points and it's a very reliable knot. So to here, far end, I'm going to have the sinker and to here, I'm going to attach whatever bait it's going to be, whether it be an egg or a uh, booby fly or whatever it's going to be, I'll stick it onto there. Cut off that tag end and we're ready to go. Okay, so now we're ready to make our cast. Now the canal we're on at the moment isn't running particularly fast, and so I've got a reasonably light weight on the far end of it, and I've got a, hopefully an appropriate coloured or sized egg, and what I'm gonna do is make sure that I stay in contact with this. It's absolutely critical. So the first thing I'm gonna do is cast it out, of course, which is right here and now. Now we haven't got too much wind, so that's not too bad but I want to get the line as straight as I can to where I am. And once it gets straight, of course, the canal's moving, so I'm having the far end twist around. Now that's not too good if I'm trying to get a natural drift, because what's the egg doing at the other end? It's swinging across the current. So this is no good for me. I've got to do it differently. So in I wind, and I'm now going to get ready to show you what we really do. Now we've learned what not to do. We're going to cast across, get the line nice and tight, and then I'm gonna move with it. So I'm on the move, I'm getting myself fitter and fitter. Now the critical thing is to stay in contact with the line. Now this is particularly uneven as you can see here, so my full concentration is on getting a good footing, not falling in, but keeping in touch with the far end of my line. Now another way to do this, when there's not too much wind around, is to use the road, because that's a lot easier to walk down. So up I go, it's not windy, and I make the choice to get across this canal. I'm happy because I'm almost three quarters, I'm over three quarters away across it. And now, it's just a question of keeping the tip of my rod as steady as I can in order to detect any bites. Most important, to keep it tight. 
because we get our indication when the line is tight. So I've got an eagle eye looking at the V where that goes into the water and I'm looking at the line to make sure that if it has a hesitation that I can strike, set the hook, make a check because at the end of the day you cannot set a hook unless the line is tight. You can't detect a bite unless the line is tight. Remember that, you can't detect a bite unless the line is tight. So we're going to get it as tight as we possibly can and then when a fish grabs it I'm ready to strike. Right, what I need to do right at this point is keep that line on the water and get ready to move, making sure that I keep the tip of the rod as still as possible and keeping that line as straight as possible. I can actually feel the far end of this and that gives me a sense of anchoring. If something bites in between, I'm real keen to set that hook. I'm keen to do it, I'm always expecting it. Stay as much as you can, 90 degrees to your line. If it's if you see that you've got a bow, take the bow out. Remember, you can't detect a bite when you've got a bow in your line. Keep the line low to the water. There's a little bit of wind just starting to blow. I want to keep that line as low to the water as I possibly can, so I'm getting a nice natural drift. Those of you who've seen anything on check nymphing will know that this is the way check nymphing works. And when you get to a point where it's quite close to you, just wind it in and just cast it out again. Make your drift as natural as possible. Keep it as square as you possibly can. You just can't fail. It really, really works. After a while, you get experienced as to whether or not you're too heavy on the sinker. If it's really dragging and banging along, then you're way too heavy. It should just be occasionally touching the bottom and uh, developing that skill will help you catch more fish. Remember, if your colour you're using isn't working, change, 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 change. No door-to-door -door salesman goes up onto the same door and continues to try and sell the same product without being run off the property or having the police called. But for some reason when we go fishing, we think that we can do that over and over again, just hoping that we'll worry one into catching onto our lure. You're much better off to change and give them something different to look at so they'll come and have a go at it. So it's later in the day and the wind's blowing a little bit now, so that means I've got to make sure that the line's quite close to the water in order to be able to detect a bite. The other thing I do when it's getting pretty windy is to put on a slightly heavier weight. So I'm using just under a quarter of an ounce to get uh, the feel. It's flowing nicely because there's a bit of movement in this canal and that really helps us. Now, as it gets towards dusk, then the fishing tends to get a bit better. Often in the middle of the day you have quite a quiet time and that's simply because everything's well, a bit lethargic, I guess. You've got, uh, you've got the heat of the day, you've got sun nice and high. It just sometimes doesn't fish as well as it probably should. So, in order to make that work well, we have a sleep. And then we come down a little bit later and you fish maybe from two hours before it gets to, to serious dusk. And often, right on dusk, there'll be all sorts of activity. So don't give up, get yourselves out there and make sure that you fish at that particular time. Now remember, when it comes to Fishing this kind of method, it's important for you to make sure you've got a very good rod, and we recommend a long rod, so something like a, a, an eight foot lox is an absolute perfect rod to use in this situation. Really good braid, because you need to be able to cast a long way, make sure that it cuts the air and goes down into the uh, water well. Obviously some uh, decent fluorocarbon so you don't break them when you hook them. And a good reel to go along with that as well. Now, all these things are available online from us at completeangler.co.nz or of course you can come and call us uh, or go into store at 484 Cranford Street. We'd love to be able to put you in the right area so that you can have the sort of results that we're having down here. We want you to catch fish because we both win when that occurs.